I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York City. A world-renowned hairstylist with a larger-than-life personality. Hey, everybody, Fab here for Fab Style Fridays. Set up, ambushed, and stabbed in his own home. It's just beyond. It's just horrible. Was his grieving widow hiding a deadly secret? Monica went shopping for an hour while Fabio was being murdered. The murder and the arrests that rocked the upscale California neighborhood. It shatters my idea of family. Then, a big development in a gruesome unsolved mystery. Very torturous, very painful death that he suffered. The body of 16-year-old Eric Cross dumped in the road outside his home. I saw my mom's face, and I knew that he died. Who done it? We want to talk to you about the murder of Eric Cross. We tracked down the prime suspect and the woman who's a person of interest. We'd really like to talk to you about what happened that night. Right now. Let's go. Let's go. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. I'm Michelle Sagona from Crime Watch Daily. This. Elizabeth Smart from Crime Watch Daily. It's Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. You got anything to say? It's Crime Watch Daily. What do you mean you don't know she's 13? You're running away now? Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. First up today, greed, betrayal, and murder. Our Pat Lalama is in Los Angeles with the very latest on a world famous beauty industry executive gunned down in his upscale home. All right, and now it'll go backwards, you say? Yep. Oh my God, that is big. This is awesome. Ah! <laughs> Fabio Sementilli had a special nickname. He was the guy we called him Papa Bear. <laughs> The internationally revered stylist and cosmetologist. Right at the end, just sprayed on onto the hair. Was ambushed on the patio of his own Southern California home and viciously stabbed to death. After the gruesome murder, the killers ransacked the house, attempted to wipe down the crime scene, and took off in Fabio's Porsche. All avenues will be investigated. Every resident on the street is going to be um, talked to to see if anything was seen. Fabio's longtime wife, Monica, was inconsolable. It's just beyond. It's just horrible. All I know is my friends just beyond just devastated. Or was it all just a convincing act? Hey, everybody. Fab here for Fab Style Fridays. Friends and family of Fabio Sementilli tell Crime Watch Daily he devoted his life to mentoring thousands of aspiring hairstylists. Kristen Wolliver was just one of them. I was brand new to the industry and he just welcomed me with open arms and always had our back and he was there for us to succeed. Otherwise what ends up happening is you become Blondzilla on the ends. He was bigger than life. He did not just slink into a room. He lit up that room. He was big, fun, full of smiles. And smiles. Yeah. But something besides his work was Fabio's top priority. And I can't wait to get home to see my family. Fabio was a family man. He was so proud of his daughters. He was proud of his wife. He loved family first. He loved his wife. Fabio didn't have an enemy in the world. So when he was found dead in his own home, police were stumped. All they had was some blood evidence and no clue who it belonged to. Monica, say friends, was shattered. I saw her at the viewing and she was wailing and being very sad. Oh, my husband, my husband. We got back in the car and said, oh my gosh, I mean, the, the how frail and how weak and how she needed to be held up. Five months after Monica buried her husband, there were still no arrests for his murder. She accepted a Lifetime Achievement Award on her late husband's behalf, appearing still broken. And everything made me so sad and to think, wow, she's a widow now and has lost her amazing husband and she is so heartbroken. But cops believe it was Monica who should have been receiving an award that night for best portrayal of a grieving widow. Because not long after, cops identified that blood evidence, tracing it to Robert Lewis Baker, a convicted sex offender who served time for raping his underage stepdaughter. According to police, Robert Baker cut his finger during the attack. 
which connected his DNA to the crime scene. Police say they have surveillance footage of Robert Baker and an unknown assailant fleeing the scene. It turns out Baker was having a secret affair with Monica Sementilli. In this nine-page indictment obtained by Crime Watch Daily, the crime, as the grand jury saw it, is laid out in glaring and shocking detail. First, accusing Monica of hiring professionals to connect her cell phone to her home surveillance system so she could monitor her husband's location. She allegedly forwarded an email containing her security password to her lover, Robert Baker. And according to the indictment, the couple live streamed the home security cameras from their cell phone while simultaneously FaceTiming. The alleged murderess cleared the house of her children so that there would be no witnesses present for the murder. Police say while her husband was being murdered, Monica went shopping to give herself an alibi. Allegedly, Monica waited until her youngest daughter came home to be the first to discover her father dead. Oh, I stick to my stomach. I mean, um, first of all, I didn't believe it. Second of all, um, how could someone do that to someone who is an amazing person? The motive, the almighty dollar. Police say Robert and Monica's motive was access to Fabio's $1.6 million life insurance policy. The couple could get the death penalty. The grand jury citing the special circumstances of lying in wait and murder for financial gain. And cops desperately need the public's help in identifying the unknown co-conspirator. Hey everybody, Fab here for Fab Style Fridays. For the thousands touched by Fabio Sementilli, there is no worthy enough punishment for the senseless murder of such a great man. Everything's all right. Peace. Both Monica Sementilli and Robert Baker have pleaded not guilty. If convicted, they face the death penalty. And right now, I want to bring in Dr. Drew Pinsky to help us break down this very disturbing story. Doc, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. So what about divorce? Why do people have to get involved in these plots? It's almost inexplicable. And whenever people's behavior is inexplicable, I always think about drugs and alcohol because people in altered states, either on substance or coming off them, can do unbelievable things. The other is psychopathy. Uh, or extreme narcissism, where people literally don't appreciate the existence of others. Now, you've written books on relationships, narcissism, things we see in this case. Yeah. I mean, what do you make of this? Well, I think you're exactly right. I mean, this is narcissism, at least in the narcissistic spectrum, and that's why we look at this in recoil. It's like, didn't they understand what they were doing? The daughter finds this horrible crime they've committed. How could somebody do that? How could somebody put somebody else in that position? Who you, does that? Well, people do that when they don't appreciate other people really exist in the way we understand one another. The idea here that she has violated the basic instinct of motherhood by putting a child in harm's way to this degree and on the heels of her own crime, if indeed this is allegedly, if indeed what she has done, your brain can't get around it and that tells you that her brain wasn't working right. People ask me this all the time, so I'm going to ask you, yeah. does anything shock you anymore? Yeah, I'm, I'm shocked all the time by people. I find myself uh, not, not to be glib, but that yuggity yuggity feeling all the time. Like, how's that possible? And whenever I have that feeling, I immediately think neurobiologically because to try to make psychological sense, to use your normal brain to try to understand inexplicable behavior, it doesn't apply. And so, yeah, I'm shocked all the time by people. I'm disappointed by people. And that's even a more troubling feeling. Dr. Drew, thank you very that's much for being here. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. For more on the story, you can go to crimewatchdaily.com. Up next, the young man's night of fun on the lake with friends takes a tragic turn when his body shows up in the front yard. What was the father's reaction in finding his son dead in front of his house? I can't even describe this torn part. What really happened to Eric Cross? A stunning new development in a crime that has haunted a small town in Michigan for more than three decades. Some, a cloud hanging over Vicksburg that everyone wants to have cleared. That's next. Now to the murder mystery of Eric Cross. After years of hunting for the young man's killer, there's been a huge development. Here's Anna Garcia. A heart-wrenching tragedy comes to a family's doorstep. 16-year-old Eric Cross is found lying dead on the side of the road outside his home by his inconsolable father. I don't remember ever seeing him cry before that. 
The whole town cries too, not only for Eric, but also for the blood of whoever killed him in a most horrific way. The very torturous, very painful death that he suffered. And when police can't find the murderer, townsfolk start whispering among themselves and pointing fingers at those suspected of being involved in his death. The rumors started coming in, or the stories started coming in from the street. Conspiracy swirl for 35 long years. It became literally an urban legend that was getting passed on from person to person. But all the tips and tales lead nowhere. We have a lot of information, but we just, we're always a little bit short of putting it together uh, enough that we could take it to prosecution. Still, Eric's case stays alive thanks to his younger sister, Jackie, who started a Facebook page for her brother. So the people from Vicksburg started friending Eric, his page, um, but then people were interested in the murder. The Facebook page became a kind of clearinghouse for everybody's stories, rumors, tips, and other information about the case. They had a place to talk about it because all these whispers had gone on in the shadows or, you know, among <clears throat> small groups of people. But now all of a sudden, like, well, here's a place we can talk about this and how it affected us or be surprised that it hasn't been prosecuted. And it looks like Jackie's persistence will finally pay off. This conspiracy is, is, is falling apart as we speak. Uh, that brick wall that was uh, built with a lot of effort over the years is crumbling down. In a stunning new development, cops finally want to put rumors to rest for good. There could be imminent arrests in the decades-long murder mystery. It's just kind of a cloud hanging over Vicksburg that everyone wants to have cleared. Vicksburg, Michigan, a quiet village about 130 miles west of Detroit. A small community, agricultural, great school system, good people. Among those good people were the Cross family, who loved Christmas, fishing, and the other simple pleasures of country life in a nice, safe place for Eric and his younger sister Jackie to grow up. We were close growing up because it was just the two of us, just the two siblings. We had each other, that was the constant. Eric was a good-natured, outgoing kid who made a great big brother. He was definitely um, loved playing outside, he was very active. So probably most fun we had together was when we were exploring outside. Fun when they were younger, but by the time Eric is 16, his mind turns to other interests like hanging out with his buddies, chasing girls, and going to parties. Your father said to police he was concerned that his son was hanging out with a bad crowd. Right, yeah, and, I, and that had been like a recent development, I would say only within the last couple months before he died. And Eric might still be alive had he not gone to one particular party. He was um, getting ready to leave the house and he was fixing his hair in the mirror. Jackie remembers it vividly. He had that really nice 80s hairdo and the song, The Look of Love, was playing on the radio. It's the last time Jackie would see her big brother alive. It's like burned into my memory, like just saying goodbye to him. And what would happen that night would be seared into the collective memory of Vicksburg. A town in mourning for Eric, but also a town without pity for a bunch of teenagers who have been living under a cloud of suspicion ever since. How has the town reacted to you? They hit me. Next, the underage drinking party that investigators say set the stage for the brutal murder of Eric Cross and the discovery of his body by his distraught parents. And I thought, well, it doesn't look like him. It's probably not him. I don't think it is him. But finally, reality sets in. Now back to the murder mystery of Eric Cross. The 16-year-old's death rocked the tiny town of Vicksburg, Michigan. Our Anna Garcia is there now with more on the search for answers. Eric Cross's last night alive began here at this lake house where one of his buddies was throwing a drinking party. So it was a beer party. It was a keg party, right? It was a kegger. For a $2 admission charge, the teenage guests got all the beer they could drink, even though many of them were underage, like 16-year-old Eric. My parents didn't even know that he went to this party. But Eric's friends were going, and there would be a lot of pretty girls there, as well as the cheap beer, which police say Eric drank for hours. 
We know he was highly intoxicated when he left the party. Under Sheriff Paul Matches and Detective Sergeant Rich Madison of the Kalamazoo County Sheriff's Department say Eric was seen leaving the party around 1 a.m. and stumbling down this road toward his home, which was less than a mile from the party house. A witness told police they saw him walk past this gas station and general store just several hundred yards from his home around 1.30 a.m. And two cars, one yellow, the other a dark color, had also been seen parked there. I believe he made it home. And whatever happened, happened after he made it home. Eric's father said he heard the front door rattling in the early hours of the morning and assumed it was his son letting himself in the house. But cops say the front door was locked and Eric likely went back out into the front yard, but exactly what happened to Eric after that has remained a mystery. At 5 a.m., Eric's parents say they heard a car with a loud muffler turning around in their driveway. 5.30 in the morning, Mr. Cross came out to get his newspaper. Then first thing he saw was his son, uh, son's shoe in the middle of the road. Then Ted Cross saw Eric's body lying on the side of the road. What was the father's reaction in describing finding his son dead in front of his house? I can't even describe crying and just torn apart. He ran back inside to get his wife, Mary Lou. When you ran out there, how can you possibly ever describe what that was like? Oh, we were just in shock. I ran back to the house and got a blanket to cover him up with. And I called a neighbor who had worked at the hospital and I wanted him to give CPR and he tried, but he said it was no use. I saw my mom's face that I knew that he died. One of the first cops at the scene was none other than Detective Sergeant Madison, who was a young patrol officer back then, and he remembers finding evidence of Eric's death strewn for hundreds of yards along the road. Plastic from car, shoes, a little more than 600 feet down, uh, there was trace evidence in that blue jean material, shirt tear material, blood and what was determined to be body tissue. Initially, it was believed that it was a hit and run, but Eric's family knew something else had happened and they pressured the police to keep digging. And then it started looking like something more involved than just a car pedestrian accident. Cops believe a group of teenagers in one of those two cars parked at the gas station, the dark colored one, drove past the front of Eric's house and saw him. At that point, he was likely grabbed uh, by this other group. One theory was they had taken Eric hood surfing. That is, he'd been tied to the hood of their car while it swerved sharply down the road and that he fell off and was run over. Is it possible at all that he was participating in that, or do you think he could have forcibly been participating in it? Hood surfing uh, did come up in the course of the investigation, only because back in 1983, that was just something that kids did. But while cops didn't know if hood surfing was involved, they became certain of something else within weeks of Eric's death. It was not a hit and run, as they had first believed. As we investigated a little bit further, it was determined this was no accident. This was more of a deliberate act, hence murder. A particularly brutal murder. What condition was um, Eric's body in? Like, what were the, the visible signs, or what did you end up learning from the autopsy and coroner's report? Eric was uh, badly injured, contusions, deep abrasions. He had uh, rope burns, there were visible twists or styrations uh, on his skin. He had uh, leg fractures. He had a large gaping laceration in the middle of his lower back. The rope burns you found on his body make you think that someone tied him up and pulled him by the back of the car, or? In conjunction with the uh, abrasions, the deep abrasions that he had. Yes. Do you think that's when Eric's body was dumped? He was run over at that point to make it look 
possibly like it was a hit and run traffic fatality. Next, could jealousy over a girl Eric was said to be flirting with at that drinking party been a motive for his murder? We're back now with more on the Eric Cross murder mystery. The Michigan teen's body was found on the side of the road covered in rope burns like he was dragged behind a car. But police still hadn't figured out who was behind the wheel of that vehicle. Anna Garcia has more on their intense search for suspects, which included a familiar face around the police department. The brutal murder of Eric Cross was a tragic big deal in Little Vicksburg, Michigan. You don't have a lot of crime and you know, for something like this to happen, it's like a blot on their town. And the 3,000 or so residents of this quiet rural community were saying a lot too, publicly, among themselves, and to the police, as imaginations ran wild. We had all kinds of uh, rumored information. Some of it was helpful, most was a waste of police time. Some of the leads were crazy, right? Uh, some of them were. They were way off base. They were a one of a kind. Is that like that he was shot in a dentist's office? He wasn't shot. No, he was not. We would get phone call after phone call of another theory of what happened, and we would ask those people, well, where did you hear this from? And we would have to keep tracking back and would come back to the rumor mill. But many of the 100 plus people police interviewed confirmed their theory that a car full of teenagers had dragged Eric by a rope along the road for hundreds of yards, run him over, and dumped his body outside his home. Are there several prime suspects? There is a core group, if you will, of young people uh, who through the rumors, through their own admissions, since uh, were together uh, that late night and early morning hours. Cops say many pointed the finger at a reputed town bully named Brent Spaulding as the ringleader and driver of the car. So Brent Spaulding is your prime suspect? Yes. Then there was Brent's girlfriend, Amber Thomas. Is she a person of interest? She is a person of interest. She has a very clear first-hand knowledge of what went on uh, that particular time. May have been in the car or at least present and knowledgeable of the circumstances. And police believe she may be the woman a neighbor heard yelling from the same car that Eric's parents had seen pull into their driveway just before Eric's body was found. And as it passed him, he could tell that there was multiple people in the car, and he heard a high pitch, possibly a female voice state, oh my God, he's seen us. Cops claim Amber was also at the lake house drinking party and was said to have been flirting with Eric, leading police to wonder if Brent's jealousy may have been a motive for what was to come. Part of our investigation disclosed that uh, Amber and uh, Eric Cross may have been uh, engaging in some flirtation. This may have been a flashpoint for what did occur. Brent already had a bad rap around town. And a witness told police there was a rumor Brent was seen pushing Eric at the party. He uh, had a temperament about him that was very threatening, and he, he simply made a lot of people nervous, even as a kid. And if he were to make a threat, you would get this feeling that, yeah, he's going to follow through on this. Police reports show one witness saying Brent thought he was the devil, called himself Lucifer, and was sent to a mental institution after the death of Eric Cross. We know from our investigation and talking to an awful lot of people that immediately after this incident, he uh, started acting crazy, for lack of a better word. Do you have reason to believe that maybe he was pretending? Well, one of our theories is that perhaps he was pretending and he was just trying to build a defense knowing that the day was going to come when the long arm of the law was going to grab him and he might be setting himself up for a uh, mentally incompetent defense. Brent's car had also mysteriously vanished. Is that kind of weird? Came down to the vehicle. Well, where would this vehicle be? We had all kinds of rumored information. The vehicle went down to Florida where the Spaulings had family. So maybe it was discarded down there. It was dumped in a pond on the property. Well, we know that didn't happen because we, we looked in the pond. 
Brent had reason to be concerned that he might be arrested. The police report shows that at least one witness told police he had actually confessed to them that he killed Eric Cross, but cops couldn't prove it, and they say all the other teenagers in the car with him that night insisted neither he nor they had anything to do with Eric's killing. Are you sure that they know something that they haven't told you? They absolutely know something they have not told us. You're certain of that? We are certain of that. And they all immediately adopted what cops call a conspiracy of silence, flat refusing to further discuss the case with police. It was about then we believed that the cover-up was in full swing. They have now remained silent for 35 years. Have they built a wall and, and stymied this police investigation? Over the years, um, they, they gradually built the wall. And, uh, and that wall was, well, if you got something, bring it on, but don't bother me anymore. Well, now police say they do have something more and that they are about to bring it on. I'm coming at them in no uncertain terms. Next, the big break in the Eric Cross cold case that has cops poised to finally make an arrest after 35 years. Now back to the murder mystery of Eric Cross. The Michigan teen was found dead on the side of the road. Anna Garcia just confronted three of the people who have been living under a cloud of suspicion ever since Eric's murder. Even after 35 long years, the good folk of Vicksburg, Michigan have not forgotten Eric Cross. It's an uplifting thing to my spirit to know that so many people cared enough to come out and to be with us and to say the prayer that they still care. Nor has anyone here forgotten that whoever killed him has still not been caught. Thank you so We're much. Thank you for Christmas everything shopping. you're doing with them and everything. Yeah, yeah. And for being here yeah. tonight. That was so encouraging. If this vigil is any indication of how the people of Vicksburg, Michigan, feel about this case, it's pretty clear they want justice. And now, will this tormented community finally get some? Thanks to a candlelight vigil like this one several months earlier to mark what would have been Eric's 49th birthday. There was a lot of media attention to that. And from that media attention, we got that phone call that we waited for. And it put the whole case into perspective and it hit information that we had always kept quiet, dead center, so we knew we were back on the road again. That break in the case, has it made up perhaps for the last three decades? The information we got was fabulous. It made the difference. This particular source of the information was just dead on. It solidified a lot of the information we had then. It made that crystal ball a lot more clear now, and it moved us closer to our target. The target remains that group of teenagers in a car police believe dragged Eric hundreds of yards along the road, ran him over, and dumped his body in front of his home. The persons of interest we have today are the same persons of interest we had years ago. And their prime suspect, the one they believe drove the car, also remains Brent Spaulding, whom they say fell apart after Eric's murder. Since the incident, uh, he's had uh, numerous issues, uh, some substance abuse issues. He's managed to find his way in and out of the county jail, and recently he was here just a couple of months ago serving a sentence. I tried to talk to Brent, and I catch a glimpse of him through the window after I ring the doorbell. Are you Brent Spaulding? Brent? Brent Spaulding, please come out. Brent, it's Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. We want to talk to you about the murder of Eric Cross. I know you're in there. I just saw you. You're in a bathrobe. But Brent doesn't respond. The whole town is pointing to you, Brent. I don't think he's going to come out. He's in there, though. Another main person of interest is still Amber Thomas, Brent's high school girlfriend, who cops say was also among the car full of kids they believe were involved in Eric's death. She has a very clear first-hand knowledge of what went on uh, that particular time. It would be nice to hear from her to get her side of the story before we proceeded on our assumptions. 
Amber is now married with children and known as Amber Masick. I try to speak with her too. Amber? Hi. Hi. Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. Uh -huh. We'd like to talk to you about the Eric Cross case. Oh, no, that's okay. Thanks. But we'd really like to talk to you about what happened that night, Amber. It seems that so-called conspiracy of silence is holding strong. But a cloud of suspicion has hung over many others who had any contact with Eric on the night of the murder. Among them, Bill Cook, Eric's best friend, who went to that teenage drinking party with him hours before Eric was killed. Bill uh, was with the core group uh, earlier in the evening. And Eric's sister Jackie helps me contact him. Hi, Bill Cook. This is Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. I'm here with Eric Cross's sister Jackie. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm so sorry I have not got back with you. The sound of silence has cracked. We we're wondering what information you could share with us about the death of Eric Cross. Okay. I'm uh, I'm with you on that. And after a 10-minute phone conversation, Bill agrees to meet me later that night to speak publicly on camera for the first time since Eric's death 35 years ago. Are you Bill? I am, ma'am. Hi, Anna Garcia, we spoke earlier. It's a pleasure, thanks for walking over. Yes, ma'am. Bill is very emotional and weeps when I mention Eric's death. He's my best friend. And that's what the family said. My best friend. And although Bill insists, as he has from the beginning, that he had nothing to do with Eric's murder, he still blames himself that it happened. He lost his life because I left him because I wasn't there to look out for him. Bill says they got separated at the Lake House drinking party. So the last time you saw Eric Cross, where was he? Sitting in a lawn chair. And I said, Eric, I'm going swimming with... Uh, a girl. Yeah. Okay. He was okay. When you came back from swimming with the girl... He was gone. Eric was already walking home down the road toward his death. What do you think happened to him? <sighs> Ma'am, if I knew that, this would be a done and over scenario. Bill says he went to the home of his girlfriend, who just happened to be Brent Spaulding's sister, Mae Britt, who died in 2007. And Brent was home? Yes. Bill says he doesn't know what happened after that because he went to sleep for the rest of the night at the Spalding house. I would never do that to my friend, and I would never allow anybody else to do it. But Bill has always been under suspicion because of his close Spalding connection. I dated the sister of the person of interest. And so that's why she and others think you might know something. I believe so. And do you know anything? Absolutely not, ma'am. Few in Vicksburg believe him. How has the town reacted to you? They hate me. I've lost a lot of um, very key people in my life. With the club of uh, down over my head, um, I don't have them as friends anymore. You've lost your friends because of this. Yes, ma'am. And Bill says he's relieved to hear there's finally been a break in the case. Do you think maybe if the police ultimately do make an arrest, that maybe that will finally clear your cloud I in hope, a way? I hope so. I really hope so, ma'am. And police now hope it's just a matter of time. A number of months ago, they passed their new investigative findings and entire case file over to the district attorney. They are now awaiting official charges and the warrants in the multiple. There were numerous people involved, not only in the actual event, but in a very systematic and organized cover-up. Though cops won't reveal what new information they have making them confident of arrests, Crime Watch Daily has learned cops requested warrants for five individuals. Not surprisingly, there's one name in town prominently on everyone's lips. Brent Spaulding. I knew who he was. I mean, I've heard over the years this name over and over. Law enforcement has too. 
Spaulding has been in and out of jail. Right now, he's facing a felony aggravated stalking charge and a separate charge for controlled substance. He is out on bond awaiting trials. Now investigators tell Crime Watch Daily there is a warrant request with the DA on Spaulding, and there's also one for Amber Thomas. Eric's sister Jackie now desperately hopes the DA will act quickly on the new information in her brother's murder case. I'm looking forward to them calling me and saying, or calling my mom and saying, we've made the arrests. After over three decades, the capture of Eric's killer and alleged conspirators can't come too soon for his family. I would like it to be settled and to be over with and so that we can all go back and just live our life peacefully without revenge and without bitterness. Same for the cops who have worked tirelessly to bring some justice for a 16-year-old boy. But this was not going to go away until it was resolved. We're going to stick with this case. Up next, a night out with friends turns tragic for a handsome young fire captain. after he shot in the middle of the street. He did so much in his very, very short time with us. Crime Watch Daily with new details on the heartbreaking case and what set the alleged gunman off. Coming up. It's an all too common problem we see all over the country, road rage. And today it's in Arizona where an angry altercation on the roads has left a decorated fire captain dead. We're teaming up with affiliate ABC 15 for the very latest. The sound of gunshots pierce the night sky. Desperate 911 calls flood into call centers. And a man lies dead in the street. There's no ambulances yet. Okay. And it's been way too long. And it's, 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 oh my God. Veteran firefighter and former Marine Kyle Brayer is the victim of another man's bullet in a deadly case of road rage. He was not the type to go looking for a fight. The tragic scene unfolds around 2.30 a.m. on a Saturday at a Tempe, Arizona shopping mall. Cops say Brayer was out for a carefree night with friends, riding a golf cart near the shopping center. He was spinning us all around. We were all having so much fun with bowling. Lindsay Cornblaw in a phone interview says she had just met the handsome firefighter through friends when their night of fun took a horrific turn. It was more shock than anything. I've never cried that hard in my life. Lindsay says it all began when this man, hers and Park, started bumping Kyle's golf cart with his car, a red Scion. He was charging at us. The guys put their feet out because they were like trying to like stop the dang car from like hitting us. Police reports revealed 21-year-old Parks had been out bar hopping and was carrying a gun when Kyle got out to speak with him. He wasn't like being aggressive about it in any way. He just wanted to like make sure that the dude would stop doing that. But before words were ever exchanged, I could tell that Kyle put his hands up because I can I know that Kyle saw the gun. Parks allegedly pointed the gun and shot the decorated captain in the head. Witnesses say the aggressive driver and would-be killer took off in his red Scion coupe, hitting several other cars as he sped away. The person who shot them, they took off in a red vehicle, is that correct? Yes, a red vehicle. Park's flight from the crime scene didn't last long. He turned himself in after seeing the story on the news, telling cops he didn't know there was a round in the gun. Now, Parks sits in jail, facing a second-degree murder charge as Kyle is given a final salute as a Marine. <laughs> and as a firefighter. We were fortunate enough to have him land here. He did so much in his very, very short time with us. Kyle will also be remembered as an entrepreneur, spearheaded a program to help high-risk veterans get in-house medical care. Here, he's seen talking about the program just last year. We've been able, for the first time in my career here in Tempe, to actually make a significant difference on a patient's um, health. And there's no doubt Kyle made a difference as his crew says a heartbreaking goodbye to their fallen brother 
was loved, admired, and respected by so many. This department's hurting. Uh, our members are hurting. Parks remains in jail awaiting his next court appearance. He has yet to enter a plea on the charge of second degree murder. According to court documents, he also maintains that he, quote, felt threatened and was justified in grabbing his unholstered handgun from his center console.